Hi, my name is Iris. Um, currently, I am part of the in-half staff at the Omni Champions Gate outside Orlando, Florida. I've done a bit of everything from theater to radio, television, live events. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in theater and my first job was in radio. So you never know where you're gonna end up in this. I'm part of this community because I believe in education and during this time, I believe everyone can improve their knowledge to get more gigs and do more things and just be more flexible in the new whatever it is we're going into. But I appreciate you're here. I hope you learned something and have fun watch the show. Hi, my name is Adam Berlin. I'm from originally from Queens, New York, and now I live in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, my work includes in the AV world is mainly all video, such as video tech, utility, steady cam, ca camera op, uh, and projection. Um, well, I'm well versatile in the video world, as you so, as I said. Um, the reason I started this industry is because of music. I'm very, you know, music oriented. I love music a lot, and I got a lot of different visuals. Um, why why I enjoy this show is more about you know ed the education and spreading the word of how how to do things and um, spread my knowledge to others is always. A lot, uh, enlightening for me, and I'd like to pay back in return. And I hope you guys enjoy the show. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of AV Educates AV Tech Talks. I want to thank you for being here so much with us on the AV Tech Talks panel and on Facebook and everywhere else that you're watching us. So let's go into some of these house rules. We go live to Facebook every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. You can get notifications by when we go live by following the AV Educate page on Facebook. And while you're at it, join the AV Educate group. We'll drop the link in the comments. If you want to join the Zoom room by texting 407-504-7690. Again, that number is 407-504-7690. This number is only used for our panelists and you won't receive any spam texts from this number, but you will receive weekly invites to the Zoom room. We're opening the rooms at 6.30 p.m. Eastern and we close the doors at 6.55. But keep in mind, panelists have to participate and have to keep their cameras on during the talk. Moving forward, due to the nature of streaming, there's a bit of a delay between when we say in our Zoom room and when it hits Facebook. So when making comments or asking questions, please provide some context. The user interface becomes more sleek and this will be lead to more meaningful engagement. Now be the sharpshooter in the room. No questions are too basic. A basic mission is to help through knowledge. People move from stage end to technician. Chances are that others have the same questions you do, so please ask away. At the same time, we welcome comments and input on the topic at hand. So don't hold back that great topic or that correction when one of us says something inaccurate. Now, we don't know everything. We are human. We don't claim to know everything. We may discuss or show the way we do something, and that doesn't mean it's the only way, but it's the way we found that works for one of us. If you have another way that's easier or yields better results, Please share that with everybody. The whole session is a live Q&A. Our questions will be discussed, the topics for about an hour, and then we'll move to more about a round table discussion. There's no formal Q&A section. Again, the whole session is a live Q&A, so don't wait until the end to ask your questions or to make your comments. And finally, a shameless plug. Please follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram so we can grow bigger and collaborate with even more amazing people just like you. That's all I got, guys. Back to the main room, back to Zoom, and back to you all in Facebook land. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching, and thanks for sharing. And welcome back to AV Tech Talks. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we got a cool show coming up. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, with Andy Dolph. We're going to talk with Andy Dolph, and he's going to share how he uses um, QLab and Apple Scripts to automate uh, functions in Zoom, which I think is is pretty interesting. Um, I don't know much about Apple Scripts, so I'm really excited to uh, to hear about how he he's done it uh, and his solutions. So that'll be cool. Uh, anybody on the panel here? Um, I know we have some QLab users, and uh, anybody who does Apple Scripting at all? Ori, what yeah. uh, what's your experience using? Uh, 
either QLab or Apple Script. I mean, we know you're the QLab guy. We had to do an episode last yes. summer. Yeah. But, uh, um, tell us a little about it. Uh, QLab and Apple Script combined are incredibly powerful tools. Uh, you can get a lot done uh, on the machine um, in terms of file organization and more. I'm sure Andy will explain. Uh, but uh, I use Apple Script in my in my day to day life too, just to make things a little bit simpler on uh, on my work machine. Uh, setting the machine, to, uh, setting displays to sleep, reorganizing Windows, opening applications in a sequence, that kind of thing. Cool. So things that just make your life a little bit easier. Yes, and help me with automating what I need to get done. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, was there was there anybody else who's using uh, Apple scripting? Jeff, I'm surprised you're you're smiling. Uh, I eat apples all the time. Yeah, uh, I love apples. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You are you're firmly in the PC camp. I I, uh, I have to remember that. I wouldn't say Great. firmly. I'm not firmly. I have one Mac. Matter of fact, it, it, we used it for a show just recently, and uh, that was the first time I turned it on in four years. Wow. Well, it, but it worked. That's uh, that's the important thing. It worked when you needed it. So, uh, great. Um, well, Omar, do you got anything uh, anything you want to add uh, before we kick it over to Andy? I don't got anything. I'm in the same boat as everybody else here. I'm, I don't really use Apple Script, big Apple user, but um, I'm, I'm interested to see what I learned today from Andy because this one seems very interesting, and I've seen all the back and forth we've been doing about it. So I'm super interested to dive right in. So whenever you're ready, Andy. Cool. Well, before we get started, just remember, get your questions uh, in. If you're on Facebook, put them in the comments and we'll get them into the queue. Uh, and then if you're here on Zoom, uh, use the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen to get those questions in. Get them in early so that we uh, we have time to get to them. And uh, with that, Andy, yeah, tell us, tell us how you're using uh, QLab and AppleScript. And so, so let me start with a story. Um, my background is as a sound and projection designer for theater originally. And for about the last 20 years, I've been the special events coordinator for audiovisual services at the University of New Hampshire. And basically that means I'm a, an in-house kind of rental staging, miniature rental staging operation within the university, responsible for most of the major events that happen. Not so much the athletic stuff, but almost everything else. Uh, ranging from, you know, little press conferences and small academic meetings to commencement for 20,000 people. And um, that one of the bright lines we drew a long time ago was that we don't do remote events. And we had a little bit of experience experimenting with streaming for a few things, and we came way too close to having no stream at all too many times and said, okay, we farmed that out. And, um, and that was probably about know, five or six years ago that we made that decision. And um, then enter COVID. And all of a sudden we're not allowed to do anything in person. And everybody is coming to us as the events people asking us how to do them online. And I mean, I had used Zoom a little bit for just sort of typical long distance meeting kind of stuff, um, enough that I was comfortable with it in that sense. I had never used Zoom webinar except as an attendee. And all of a sudden, I need to be able to do webinars that look like a show. And th because the first set of them that we had to do were for accepted students days, which are students who have applied and been accepted, but haven't decided to come yet. And we know that one of the things that drives them deciding to come to UNH, which in turn drives all of us having jobs because they pay our salaries uh, with their tuition, it was, it is these accepted students days, which have always been very high touch in-person events. So how do we take them online and make something that works? And, you know, and as we talk about this, one of the things that came up is we need to do a good, clean show. It needs, you know, it's going to be kind of like a TV show. And it needs to be, even though we're not going to go as far 
in terms of production value as I would like, it needs a clean, clear open, it needs a clean, clear close. Um, it needs to have an organized setup in the middle and so forth. So, um, and so I started with, okay, so we want to start broadcasting the webinar before the audience comes to try to log in that I would prefer that they never see the host hasn't started this webinar. And, um, you know, and so we're going to start with a title slide and some background music because that way when they log in, they at least know that they're at the right event. And I suspect this is not news for anybody in the audience here, th these sorts of ideas. And, um, you know, so I got some music from the production music library. And um, usually when I'm prepping presenters and hosts, I tell them I'm going to play some music I stole from an elevator. Um, and um, so it's, um, and, and so what I do, the typical process is I get all of the panelists online a half hour before the show. The idea is that gives us 15 minutes to make sure everybody's connections are good, that if they don't remember how to use a screen share, we go over it, et cetera, um, and do a quick rundown of the format. Then at about 15 minutes before the scheduled start, everybody's mics and cameras off, we go live, and I do something like this. Um, and I'm uh, not going to put up the music because we're concerned about Facebook deciding that it's a copyright violation, even though it isn't. But, you know, welcome to Facebook um, and, and YouTube and all of these large platforms. So um, I just hit one button on a stream deck to do that. And now I'm going to hit the same button again. It's the go button. And... Um, and then this would be the top of the show. And typically what I do is have the, um, the first person who's going to speak, um, the first person who's going to speak will um, put their camera and mic on right before I'm going to dump out of the slot, the pre-show. And so then I dump out of the pre-show, that person is full screen, they start the program, then everybody else turns their cameras on, because usually at that point I'm in um, speaker view for the audience. So, um, so now let me, I'll show you, I'm going to share my QLab screen. Oh, before I do that, let me just talk a little bit about the setup this has evolved into. Um, I started doing these on m the computer that at the time was my daily driver machine, um, which is a more or less top of the line uh, 2013 MacBook Pro. And um, in for the simple shows, like what I just showed you, it would do okay. But if I had to play back video, it would drop frames like crazy. And if I had to also stream out of Zoom, it would um, not quite come to a halt, but very close. And so we were in a spending freeze because normally, you know, I'd say, OK, you know, I need to buy a computer. At the time, it would have been probably an i7 Mac mini would have been plenty. Um, you know, it's like 1500 bucks. It's not that big a deal, but they wanted us to basically like, basically in order to be allowed to spend money, you had to say, if we don't spend this money, my entire department will come to a screaming halt. That was the test. And so I was like, okay, the campus is shut down. Is there anything that I can steal that isn't being used? And the answer was, fortunately, our um, multimedia production lab, which normally is available in the library for students to go and edit video or produce podcasts or that kind of stuff, um, was shut down because the campus was shut down. 
And they, and so I talked to the guy who runs it and he basically said, yeah, take whatever you want. So long as we get it back before we reopen, whenever that is, and there still isn't a date. Um, and so I ended up with, um, two 2013 Mac pros kind of not quite the bot, the entry level of the trash can Mac pro, but, um, but close with two monitors and, two uh, 27 inch IMAX of about the same vintage, I think. Um, and, um, and so I took one IMAX, which you see behind me and one Mac pro, which is in front of me and put the other one at the home of the other tech who primarily does these events with me. So there were two of us that had rigs to do two simultaneous events with identical systems. Um, I've then added a third monitor to mine, which becomes important because uh, to do this the way I do it, QLab needs a monitor to output to. Now, it could be one of those dongles that makes the computer believe that there's a monitor there, even though there isn't, that would have worked fine too. But I happen to have a monitor and it's nice as a confidence thing for me to be able to look over to the side and see that I have in fact put on the screen, the thing that I think I'm screen sharing. Um, now I also here, I can, Zoom out and I'll show you a little more. Whoops. So this is the part of the room that I can show you. So uh, because the rest of it's behind the camera. Um, so I've got two monitors on the Mac Pro that are in front of me that you can't see. This monitor is the third Mac Pro monitor that basically is only used for QLab output. It's where the videos go that I share from. And then this is the monitor that was on my desk to begin with that's connected to the laptop here, which is my daily driver machine. And then I have the iMac behind me. Um, and I'll get into when I use the second computer a little bit later because it's not a part of my standard setup. Um, and like most technical production spaces, my office is just an absolute disaster. Um, so, okay, and I completely lost the white balance. That's exciting. Here we go. Um, so, um, okay, so with the, the physical setup explained, let me share my QLab screen. And um, so what I've got is, uh, this is my basic Q, Q list. And I only actually hit go in this twice, just for anybody who's not used to reading QLab, this very last column. Can you guys see my pointer or do I need to use a annotation? No, we can see it. Pointer. Great. Um, so the um, these icons are what happens at the end of the queue. Do not continue, then it would show no icon. Auto continue, which means as soon as I start the queue that's highlighted in blue, it's gonna start the one under it. And, or auto follow, which means wait until the queue is done and then go. So the, the three arrows is auto continue and the, um, the one that looks to me like a boat anchor is um, auto follow. And so what happens when I hit go and I'll, I'll also show you here, I've got, if I can find the right thing, um, this is a, uh, a uh, software version, but I, this is represents a physical stream deck that I have uh, to my right um, that basically 
it does a number of things, but all of these, except for the panic iMac button, all of these are triggering things in QLab. So mostly the one I use is the go button, but if everything goes wrong, I can panic QLab, which is QLab's term for fading out everything and stopping. Um, <coughs> the panic iMac button, when I'm using the QLab on this computer to trigger QLab on the iMac behind me, um, then that one play, that will let me panic that machine from right here if it does something bad. Uh, previous queue and next queue is obvious. Uh, this button just brings up the Zoom invite window because every time I start a webinar, I pull up the Zoom invite window to get the um, meeting ID so that I can open and log in as an attendee on another computer. Um, the view button um, is switches Zoom between um, speaker view and gallery view, which obviously switches for the audience. Um, and then the mute and unmute for my mic. Um, so I hit go on the stream deck. It puts up the title slide. It runs the Apple script that I'm going to show you in a moment that starts Zoom screen sharing. And then it also starts a separate cue list that has the music in it. And then it fires a couple more Apple scripts that open the Zoom chat and participants panels because if you have them docked to the Zoom window, when the Zoom window goes away because you're screen sharing, your participants in chat also go away, but I always want them. So that brings them back up. And then this is a group queue, which is really just for my own visual separation. Um, and um, that when I'm ready to start the show, we fade the music and the title slide, those happen at the same time because that's an auto continue. And then when this one finishes, it waits another three seconds just to be safe. And then it kills the screen share. Um, and, um, and then another five seconds after that, it stops the title slide and we're into the show. And I'm gonna show you some more complicated stuff later, but honestly, 99% of the webinars I do use this file to the point that I made it a template in QLab so that by default, if I open a new QLab file, it's this template that's ready for me to just drop in the title slide. So let's start with this. Are there any questions about what I've shown so far before I go into the Apple script? Uh, nothing, nothing's coming on Facebook. Uh, on Zoom, we had um, more of a comment. Eugene Palmer said, spending is frozen across edu educational institutions. I think a lot of educators are finding that oh, to yeah. be the case. Um, and Raymond Sweet had said, what are you using for the extra Zoom window? Maybe that's what you're using to broadcast to Facebook. I'm not sure if that was a question for me or for you. I, I'm sure it was a question for you. I think he's probably talking about your encoder window. Probably. So, uh, Raymond, just give us a, you know, update me on that question and uh, and we'll try to get back to it. But that's all we have for now. So anyone who has questions, um, please get them into the comments on Facebook or the Q&A here in Zoom. And we'll make sure we'll, uh, yeah, that was for me. So, uh I'm happy to, Raymond, go into some of my setup at another time because I want to make sure we have, uh, maybe at the end, because I want to make sure we have time to get to everything Andy wants to cover. But uh, I have an elaborate setup. I'm doing dual window captures and using OBS and kind of switching the Facebook view and the webinar view. So there's many things happening on this side. Um, it did look like we have a question uh, from the panel. Uh, Adam, did you have something? Yeah, this one, is, Andy, would you mind uh, just uh, hitting go just to see what you're doing? Would you uh, mind? I'm, hap I'm happy to. Uh, it's not going to be anything super exciting, but here we go. I'm going to hit go now. And so you can see my title slide is playing, and the title slide is on the other screen here. And, Would you um, mind showing that, that showing that? This, the other screen 
Uh, do I have a way to do that without stopping what I'm doing? No, I don't have I don't have a good way to switch what screen I'm showing you because I'm doing it in screen share, not in the switcher. Okay. So it's just that same it's that same thing that said um, spring semester twenty twenty one reopening. Okay. That that I showed a minute ago. Um, yeah. So that's the title slide. The music would be playing, but I've got that these cues disabled. But you can see it's it's counting numbers as if it was playing it. Yeah. Gotcha. And um, and then this once it runs leaves the um, leaves the cursor here. So then I hit go again, and now it's fading out the title slide. It would be fading out the music. It gets rid of the um, and brings this bank over to here, right? Right. It it well, all it does is just end the screen share. Okay. So um, and then Zoom just goes back to the camera because it doesn't have a screen share anymore. Gotcha. Um, does that help? Yeah. So if there are more questions, please, as we go along. Um, so I'll show you a few of the, um, oh, I of course ended my screen share. So now I've got to start it again. Um, this is my Q list. So again, just some basic Q lab here that I've got the Q lists window over on the side, three Q lists, one called main show cues, one called music, one called device controls. The device controls is where I put all my Apple scripts so that I don't have to keep duplicating the script, the Q with the actual script in it, that I just put them here. And then I use start cues in my main um, Q list that fire each of these whenever they're appropriate just to um, do what I'm, what I'm uh, asking it for. But then I can run that, I can hit that one script as many times as I need to in, um, in a given session. So let's come over here and we'll look at a really simple one. This is about as simple as Apple Script can get. And um, so can you guys read this or is it too small? It is a bit small. If you, I don't know if you have the ability to zoom it in. Uh, if I can remember the, no, let me try something. Also, people watching on Zoom can boost it, so you should be able to up it by. Yeah, boosting. no, but I, I've got I've got a better solution because I think if I do that, uh, does that make it better? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Definitely. Okay. Awesome. Um, so um, basically, all we're doing is this is a really simple Apple script. Oh, let me also give a disclaimer. I am not an Apple script programmer. I'm not a software developer. I know a little bit of 20 year old HTML. I knew a little bit of basic on an Apple II, um, a little bit of like um, scripting on, um, Unit, Unix scripting and DOS batch files, some of that kind of stuff. But I am not a programmer. I really do not understand AppleScript. I look at things that people who really understand AppleScript do and copy them and edit them to try to make them do what I want. And then I Google a lot to find more examples until I get one that works. Um, so... Where do you, uh, where would you find those, uh, those code, you know, the, the bits of script that you copy and edit, edit, where do you, where's, is there somewhere? I um, typically, so there's two places. One is I'll just put into Google. If it's a normal, like typical Apple script thing, like how do you make Apple script send a keystroke? I will just put into Google Apple script send keystroke. Oh, I see. The question about Zoom OSC is a great question. And 
Um, and I know Andy and have talked to him, Andy Carluccio, the developer of it. And um, I'll talk about why I'm not using Zoom OSC in a minute, but I think it's a really cool product. And um, But at the time I started doing this, the, even the first version of Zoom OSC hadn't been released. So there's some of this could be done probably in Zoom OSC, and this works, so I keep doing it. Um, but there are a couple of things that Zoom OSC doesn't do yet that um, have also held me back. So, um, so basic, um, basic Apple script. What we're doing is we're telling the application Zoom to activate. Because if we want to send it a keystroke, it has to be active because obviously the keys are going to go to whatever is at the front. So activate is like clicking on the window. Um, and, then you t and then the way you send a keystroke is the way you do almost anything in Apple Script is that it has to be inside a tell block, tell application, whatever, and then end tell when you're done. And inside that, we say send keystroke, lowercase a, using command down and shift down. And that sends um, command shift a, which in this case is the, um, the, the keystroke to um, mute and unmute my mic. So the first version of this, that was all I did. If Zoom had a way to do it with a keyboard, then I could do it. And if it didn't, I could not do it. And um, so, um, so I worked with that for a while. And then I thought about, um, you know, and I have a number of things I can do, like, you know, as I say, the local mic mute, opening the participants panel, opening the chat window. And I still do them this way because they work fine. Um, opening the invite window, anything that Zoom gave me a keystroke to do, I do this way. But when I wanted it to start and end the screen share, I have a problem. Because while there's a keystroke for screen sharing, what it does is, um, what it does is, is it opens the screen share dialog box, and that's as far as it gets you. And then you have to click. And remember, I told you that um, I put a Mac Pro and, a, and an iMac at the house of the other tech uh, who it works for us part time, who also does events. And uh, his name is Alexander Taylor, and he's a whole lot smarter than I am. And he particularly knows a lot more about the under the hood operation of the Mac than I do. Um, and he said, well, you could use accessibility scripting if you knew what the things were called to make it reliably click where you need it to. And I was like, yeah, that's interesting, but how the hell would I find out what they're called? And then I don't know where he ran across it, but he ran across a tool, and I'm gonna stop the screen share, and because I'm gonna need to, I don't think this will fit in that window. Uh, that's, yeah, it's supposed to be resizable. Let's try this. If I put this here, and there we go. Okay. And I found this uh, application called UI Browser. And if I was smart, I would have gotten the um, URL for it, but I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, at least in the, the Zoom chat. Um, Great, and then I'll put it in the Facebook once I, once awesome. I send it. And um, this is 
50 or $55, something like that. And, um, and it, for somebody who is kind of clueless like me, um, it is just amazing. So what I do is say, choose an application as my target. I'm going to choose Zoom. By the way, this can make Zoom slightly um, unstable. It doesn't usually make it crash, but it has sometimes. And obviously, I'm doing this on the Zoom I'm talking to you on so I can screen share it to you. So if I crash it, I'll be right back. But I think it'll be OK. Um, so now this shows me, here are the things Zoom knows about. So we've got this, a dialog box called share status bar. And I have to kind of guess what it is, but based on how many buttons how and how many text things and how many images, I can figure out that that is the, um, the little green and red bar that appears under the control, under the icon bar um, that says you are screen sharing with the stop share button. And I can um, find here's the share tool. Okay, so here's the share toolbar. And I've got a chat window and a Q&A window. So some of them are easy to figure out what they are, others aren't. But you can always um, you can always sort of um, mush your way around. Minch match different parent. I've never seen that before. That's fascinating. Um, all right, let's try the chat button and the chat window and see if that helps us here. So, okay, so let's take the zoom button for the chat dialog box. So now I can come down here to where it says Apple script. Um, and let me make this a little bigger so you can see it. Hopefully that will fit. Yes. Okay, good. So now I can come here to um, the various Apple script things I can get. So let's say I want to click that button that I've now found. Well, there I go. It tells me that's what I need to put into Apple script in order to click that button. And, but there's a little more to it than that because we need a tell block wrapper and there are two here, short and safe. Um, I have not had a problem using the short one. Um, other people um, have done, uh, other people may have trouble, but with Zoom, it hasn't crashed anything. The safe one, I think basically adds better error handling. And honestly, I'm not enough of a programmer to care so long as it fails silently, if it fails. And I just know from experience, it's going to fail silently, um, which, you know, is why I say, I, I said, I think in the description that this is a hack and anybody I've told about it, I've said, look, this is a hack. It's a good hack, but it's a hack. And it's not, you know, cause I thought about, should I, you know, put my template and my script up on a website for other people to grab? And my immediate answer was no, because I don't have the time and energy to support people not understanding how to do it. And that's why I'm doing it this way. I am not going to share the Apple script. I'm happy to teach people to fish, but I sort of see it as a test that if you can figure out how to reproduce what I've done from what I'm showing you, you probably can figure out how to troubleshoot it. Because here's the thing. Any of this can break at any time. Every update of Zoom may break the automation. So don't update Zoom right before you're going to do an event. Now, that's the approach I take with all of my software, is if I'm in the middle of production, I'm not going to update 
anything unless I absolutely have to because something broke. On the other hand, um, you know, okay, and often the time I will update like Zoom or something is right after an event. As soon as I finish an event, I'll leave my QLab open, update Zoom, start a new webinar, and see if my scripts still work. And the good news is I don't have very many to test. It takes like three minutes. And so far, every time but one, I've been okay. And one time, it absolutely did not work. The screen share would not work. And that's when I ended up going to this UI browser-based thing because um, I had come up with a keystroke scripting way to navigate the share dialog and it just stopped working. I have no idea why. But Zoom changed something and it didn't work anymore. Yeah, go ahead, Adam. Uh, just would you mind, you know, I'm it's scripts are, you know, not my forte of, I, you know, I have a little bit of HTML, uh, HTML, sorry, um, experience from when I was younger. I haven't really, you know, dabbled too much of that. Would you mind running what you just did? Um, I can't, this is not runnable. Okay. Once I finish explaining it. I'm going to show you the actual script that I use to control the screen share. And then I can absolutely run that, but it happens on three different monitors. So I can only show you one of them at a time. Okay. Um, so, um, because here's the thing, this is just a wrapper, right? So I need this part, activate application zoom.us tell application system events, then, so basically what we're saying is we're gonna activate Zoom. Now we're gonna tell system events to tell Zoom. And then we put the thing we found up here, the, the command to click it, click button two of window chat in, um, in the tell block. So it would go right under the insert GUI scripting statements line. And you're able to copy and paste from there too? Yes. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So um so that's really all I do in UI browser. Let's come back over to QLab now. And let me show you my basic standard start script. If I can size this window appropriately so that we get it as big for you as we can. All right, good enough. So, um, so let me walk through this kind of, I'm gonna just move this over so that it's closer to me. Okay, let me walk through this line by line. So we're gonna activate application zoom.us and then we're gonna tell system events. Um, and I don't remember why I needed this. Oh, because I'm gonna test. So what I'm doing here is set a variable called active app to the name of the first application process whose frontmost is true, which is a very complicated Apple script way of saying, tell me what the application that's active is, the one that would receive keyboard input. Andy, one more thing. To, I'm sorry to ask. Is sure. that for uh, the colors, I noticed there's color difference differences is there any mean anything with color yes um the apple does this automatically when you compile the script okay. green are variables um blue i'm not and and i'm honestly not sure blue is blue bold are commands okay. and and um the blue not bold are like I, i'm not sure um, 
I think name, I think uh, anything purple is constants um, or properties of something. I, we're, we're at the point that I don't know very much about this. Um, so, um, but when you're writing the Apple script, you don't get the color. You only get the color if it compiles successfully. So I, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, other than that, if something is a color that you weren't expecting it to be, that probably means you typed it wrong and there's a typo in it. Um, okay, so we're setting the variable called active, active app to the name of the active application. And then we're, we've told, we're tell system events to tell the process zoom.us and now we hit an if statement. So if then, so we're going to do a test. If zoom.us is in the variable active app, then we're going to do another test. So basically what this does is make sure that if Zoom didn't activate when we told it to, we're not even going to try to do anything else because God knows what application is going to get any of these messages if they go anywhere at all. So if zoom is not active, then we come down to this end. If it just jumps right down to here and it exits and that way the script exits without throwing an error, but it hasn't tried to do anything. So that's like your kind of like your insurance policy. Like that's right. If Zoom isn't work isn't up and running, it's not going to send some command to some other program that's in the focus that may be using a similar uh, syntax. Yep, absolutely. D Iris, did you have a question? Yeah, you're doing all this to start a screen share, and then it automatically stops, and the person does their presentation. Class starts talking. Is there one for the end too, or is this only like for a beginning of a program or after a certain amount of time, can it pop back into a closing statement? Uh, I would use the same one that I would just trigger because all this script does is start a screen share. So anywhere in the program that I need a screen share, like if somebody wants me to run their PowerPoint for them because they're calling in from a phone or something that it wouldn't be easy to share from, then I actually export their PowerPoint as a bunch of JPEGs right. and put them into QLab and run it that way. So basically I can hit that start screen share script as many times during the show as I need. And I actually have two versions of the start screen share. One version of the start screen share um, script is the normal one that I use, which is a normal screen share. The other one, Che also checks the optimize for video box. So let's say I've got some a bunch of stills and a video at different points in a webinar. I don't have to remember to change settings to get good motion um, because that optimize that optimize for full screen video checkbox is basically saying prioritize frame rate over resolution for motion. And so I just hit the appropriate script to start the screen share that I need. Now, how do, does, is there somewhere in this script where it can choose which window or application yep. I'm, to I'm screen share? There. Oh, great. Good. Um, so we've gotten through this one. Zoom is open. Then the next one tests, and notice the stuff that I haven't copied and pasted, I try to comment so that when I come back to it, I know where the hell I am. Um, I am a terrible programmer, meaning I don't comment a lot of what I do. Uh, getting into the habit of writing comments so that when you look at it a year later, you know what you did, or if somebody else has to deal with your code, they know what you did is a good idea. Um, do as I say more than as I do, but, you know, that's... That's how it goes sometimes. So now we're going to test 
if we're in a screen share. So the only time that there's a thing called Zoom share status bar window, and I found this by playing with Zoom and watching what happened in that UI browser tool, um, the only time that Zoom share status bar window exists is when I'm in a screen share. So if I'm telling it to start a screen share and we're already in a screen share, I don't want to try to start another one because again, my keystrokes are going to go to the wrong place or my clicks are going to go and do something unpredictable. So what I do is exit and the command to end a script is return. So if the zoom status bar is window is there, then I'm in a screen share, so I exit with the return command. If I'm not, then I hit the this else. So in other words, if there is a Zoom screen share status bar window, then return. Otherwise, do all of this, which is actually doing the work. So the first thing we're going to do is, is send command shift S which opens the window to start a screen share. And then what I'm doing is I am going to set a variable called send status to get the value of checkbox one of the window of the share window, which that's what it's called. So what, I, so what that is, uh, Oh, sorry. I'm, I misread my variable. It's, SND in this case means sound status. Um, it could be called George, but using things that are descriptive is helpful. I don't know why I didn't put put um, vowels in that. It would have been much easier to read it. Um, so, um, so in this case, that that sound status variable is going to get a value of zero if it's not checked and one if it is checked. Now, I always want it to share audio because either it's sharing the music or there's no audio for it to share. So if it shares audio with the video, I don't really care. So I always want it to share audio. And uh, so if the status of that checkbox is zero, meaning it's unchecked, then click checkbox one of window uh, of this of the share window, and that will click the checkbox. If the status of this is one, then this test fails. And we just jump to the end if. And it doesn't do, because that's what an if statement does. If the test is true, then do this thing. If not, skip this thing. Now, I want to make sure that the optimize for video checkbox is off in this one. Because if it was on last time and I open it again, it'll still be on if I've done multiple screen shares in a show. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm not optimizing for video when I don't want to be. And that's checkbox two. And I use the same variable because I just copy, copied and pasted down here. So it's still called sound status, which again, if I was a good programmer, I would have fixed, but I didn't. And it doesn't matter because it's already done with the first use of it. So same process here for the second checkbox. But in this case, we're testing if it's, if it is checked, right? Because we're testing for a one, then click it to uncheck it. And then we get to this selects what to share. And I figured this out because I had to mess with it. So the button numbers are from the scroll area where you, you know, can click on which desktop or which application you want to share from, um, and they're, they're, they appear to be numbered left to right, top to bottom, which is logical. But I had to figure it out to make sure that it was. Yeah. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I just 
wanted to know for those notes you put in, is that are they noted in your perspective when you're doing when you're seeing it as you go? Like when you're like so, so I ne I never look at this except if I'm editing it. Okay, but those notes are not like you know, like you know, when you're doing like keynote, you see that you know how like when something is like seen like the little notes on the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. This would this be appearing? Something like that? Well, this is never gonna show on the screen. Okay. So it's just it's really just text. So okay. it is in the text. If I copy the text and paste it somewhere, then the notes go with it. But anything that starts with two hyphens tells Apple Script to ignore the rest of that line. Okay. So and that's where, how where, you, is that, where is that note notated? That or is that something that is that in the application that the program that you were shown before was that? The no, text? that's something you just have to know about Apple Script. Is that any programming language has a way to do comments? Okay. And the way to do comments in Apple Script is two uh, is two dashes. I learned it because I took an example from somewhere that had comments in it. Um, so, um, okay. So now I'm gonna click button two of list one of scroll area one of, of the share window. And in that case, that's the one called desktop two, which is how the monitor that I share, that I put the QLab content on shows up. That the Mac reliably, and I tested this, so long as all three monitors are connected, calls that monitor too. Now, I will never try to use this technique to share an application window because it's um, it's just unpredictable what order they're going to show up. Now, maybe if I dug into UI browser more, I could find a way to capture the, to access the text on the button and iterate through the buttons to test which one had a certain name, but I'm not going that far. But it doesn't matter because I've designed my system so that I'm only ever sharing from one place. And in this case, it's what Zoom calls desktop two. Um, and then the last step is to click the share button, which is button one of the window. So basically what we're doing, I'm going to sort of summarize this and then I'll, I'll, then I'll ask for questions. So if you have questions about any of this, uh, how this works, go ahead and put them in. Um, is we start by making sure Zoom is open, right? Then we check to see if the window exists that would tell us we're in a screen share. If it does, we're done. If it doesn't, we click, we check the checkboxes, the two checkboxes. That's this. Then we select which thing we want to share. And then we click the share button. And now we're in a screen share. This took me probably three or four hours one night to get this to work. But having done that, it works every time. And I don't have to worry about, um, I, I don't have to worry about trying to um, make sure that I don't click the wrong thing and share the wrong desktop. And the number of errors that this eliminates is enormous for me. And for you, um, you always have QLab as your desktop too, right? Is that correct? That yeah, my QLab output is always desktop too. All right, so that makes it a lot easier <clears throat> uh, than if you had a, you know, an, uh, if you're picking an application window, for example, you're you're sharing the entire desktop. I wouldn't try. I just, I've just decided that I'm always going to share the application window, that I'm always going to share the desktop, and whatever needs to be shared by my QLab is gonna go on that desktop and is gonna have to fill it. 
Um, and for what I've been doing, I've never hit a situation where that didn't work. And, um, and honestly, if I was, if I was teaching anything other than this Apple script, I would be doing this Zoom differently. That that's a good example of where I would use the um, where I would use the iMac behind me, because the video there's a second there's the the monitor in it, and then it's um, and the video out is duplicated on an HDMI that goes into a web presenter that's connected to this computer. And it also goes to another monitor that's up there, that's on a shelf in the back so that I can see what's happening on that computer without turning around. And I have a Bluetooth keyboard and a Bluetooth trackpad that control that computer. So, um, so normally if I was teaching, I don't know, Keynote or something, I would do all of my keynote stuff on there and then bring it in through the web presenter as a camera, um, which I might pipe into the screen share function for the resolution reasons, but I would just do it on another computer. The thing is, this Apple script is absolutely unique to this computer because it requires the three displays. And so I'm doing it all from one machine because otherwise I would have had to rewrite the Apple script to work with a different setup. And I, honestly, I thought about it and I just ran out of time. <laughs> um, and so it's making the screen sharing a little bit more awkward and my ability to demonstrate things a little more complicated when they happen on multiple displays. But um, it but it lets me run the actual script that I use. And I know one of the things I know, which is another reason I don't just give this away, is that if somebody else runs it on their Mac with a different configuration, it probably isn't going to work right without editing the script. And so, like I said, it's a hack. It's a really good hack, but it's a hack. Um, and it also, I guess it, it helps, obviously, like you're saying, to be on your own setup that is consistent uh, from day to day. Like you said, you always, you've made that decision and you've made some conscious choices that yep. desktop to from this particular Mac is always going to be the output uh, screen from QLab. Which is why I've put that monitor in the most awkward position. Right? Because I just need to be able to glance over and say, yep, that's the right thing. Gotcha. Um, so, so I've got my two main monitors, which for whatever reason, the Mac calls one and three. Um, I wish I could change it. I really, really want the QLab to be three, but you can't. So, um, but it, it is, it's very particular to this setup. And uh, there are a couple of people, uh, by the way, if you get into QLab, absolutely join the Google group for QLab. It's incredibly helpful. And there are a number of people who put in an enormous amount of time helping other people figure out how to make QLab do what they want it to. And a couple of them are absolutely brilliant AppleScript programmers who have figured out how to do with AppleScript stuff that I would have just said, oh, there's no way you can do that. Mm -hmm. And somebody asks for it. And an hour later, one of them has posted an Apple script saying, I haven't really tested this carefully. So use, you know, use at your own risk, but uh, this seems to do what you're asking for. And it just, you know, causes elephants to come marching out of the Mac or something. You know, it's like, how the hell do they do it? Um, and, um, so, uh, so I have a, I have a quick question yeah, yeah. for you, Andy. So when you run this script, what does it end up looking like in Zoom? Does the window actually pop open, or does the it script happens, run so quick that you don't yeah, see it? It happens so fast you don't see it. Okay. Um, I could put weights in the script if there was a reason I wanted to see it. Um, I could put a pause somewhere, and, and it never. Um, 
I guess it never doesn't trigger, right? There's not, there's nothing where it hangs up because, uh, you know, Zoom takes too long, you know, like the, where it triggers faster than what Zoom can get it to, you know, I, I'm just wondering if there's any conflicts, you know, not have you had it hang would, up? It has not. Well, that's good. Um, every once in a while, it will flake out. Um, and I am always watching when I hit it to make sure it does what I'm expecting it to do. And I'm prepared to jump in and do it manually if I need to. And it's a delay of a couple seconds if I have to do it manually. It's not a big deal. Um, and I would say, I would say I'm hitting an error one in several hundred. Okay, that's good odds. Maybe more, uh, maybe even better than that. And so far, our reboots always fixed it unless it was broken by a Zoom update. Um, and I try to reboot. Quick this. question for you. I'm sure. sorry, in the middle of the uh, thought process. Um, wait, are you referring to a, a the language of wait or the weight of what you're saying? Um, I would have to look up what the command is for Apple script to tell it to, to wait if I wanted to do it in the script. Okay. Honestly, the way I would probably do it is break the script into two queues and do the waiting in the queue lab programming because that's something I deal with all the time and understand really well. Um, my goal, the, the, where I was going when I was talking about the guys who do this amazing Apple script stuff, there are people who use very complex Apple script in their shows. And um, and and Ed or Omar, remind me to talk to you guys offline. I have I have a guest that you guys should get if he's willing to do it. Who's a friend of mine, who is a variety entertainer who does unbelievably complicated stuff running his show in QLab. Is he's it's really cool. I don't know if he would feel like it was giving away too much of the farm to share, but <laughs> he uses a lot of Apple Script and a he lot of everything else. He could tell us, but he'd have to kill us, apparently. Yeah, maybe. Uh, it's it's wait w a i t. Um, right. So you're, what you're talking about is, and what we were discussing would be uh, adding a, a little bit of time, maybe a millisecond between each command, so that, for example, if the GUI took too long to load or or Zoom, yes, like a delay, Don. Exactly, like a delay, so that. You don't have those things hang up. Um, one of the things that Andy from ZooMOC, for example, said he was able to fire about 40 commands in a second, uh, he was finding, was the kind of the limit. So you wouldn't want to have uh, too many commands. If, if this was a much longer script doing much, a ton more things, it may you may need those delays so that those commands fire in succession and actually do what you needed to do. Yeah, I don't know if that... It would not surprise me if Apple script is smart enough to what the OS is doing to not overwhelm the thing it's sending UI commands to, but I'm just guessing. Right. Um, I know for sure with MIDI commands or OSC commands, you usually, if you're using a powerful computer or not an ancient computer, you can almost always send MIDI or OSC commands faster than a lot of things you could be sending them to could deal with them. Um, However, right. and, and and because these are UI commands, that's uh, a, another reason why I was asking about delays because no. you're it's reliant on having a UI, and if you're never seeing the UI and or the UI doesn't load, and I don't know how Zoom negotiates. To, to, I mean, I guess using desktop one or two is the safest bet because Zoom is always going to be using one or you know those are going to be an, always an option. Uh, right. Otherwise, it has to look at and see what you have uh, exactly. as other inputs. So that's right. So it's smart the way you're doing it, and and the the safeguards that you have put in in the beginning of the strip script makes sense. Um, yeah, and and so far it served me pretty well, as they say, knock on wood. Um, so uh, I'll show you. I also have, I have another script here. This one is. Oh, sorry. Before I before you do that, I was wondering, yeah. are you able to show because uh, just in case anyone isn't familiar with the screen share window what that looks like so they can see where those check marks are and where those decisions, those, those scripts are pointing to as far as the desktop two and the optimize for video and, and sound or, uh, well, yeah, you had optimized for video. Uh, I you... don't have a way to get zoom to screen share a zoom window. 
Okay. If you don't oh, mind. Wait a minute. Yes, I do. Yes, I okay. do. I just have to do it on the other computer. Okay. If it's too much, I know that I can screen share it. Uh, I just didn't want to interrupt your screen share. Uh, no, I'll, why don't you do it? Cause right. you're, cause I'd have to set it up. Okay. Like, so let's, uh, stand by one second. Let me get rid of the, the pip there. Cause nobody needs to see two of me. So I believe I'm able to, to do this. Let me, let's see. I'm going to share this and then I'm going to. All right, so we should be seeing, yes, awesome. So yep. from what Andy was showing us, and sorry for my cluttered uh, cluttered desktop with things. Um, so desktop one and desktop two. So first of all, it would ask us if, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, walk through it just sure. Quickly. So it would see first if this window was open, and if it was, it would stop the script, if I understand correctly. No, that's not what I'm testing for. What I'm testing for is the green and red bar. The green and red bar. Up above. Oh, okay. The, the menu bar here. Right. Because Copy. I want to know if we're in a screen share. If so we're already not, in it. Yep. Not if, not if you have the selection window, if you're already in a screen share. Correct. Right. Got it. Got it. So is that, that's the first test. And if it fails, it doesn't try to open another one. If it passes, right. then it was, if I remember, I guess, I don't remember every step in order. It was the share sound. Or That's correct. Okay. Yep. Share sound, then and optimize for video. Yep, so I make sure so, that those are set the way I want them. Right. So this would be checkbox one. This yep. would be checkbox two. Yep. Then as it went through, if those uh, were checked, it would figure it out. If not, it would check them. And then it would select what is your desktop two, which for me is a different desktop. And right. then that would launch your screen share with what you had in QLab. Is that right. correct? And then it clicks the share button is the last and step. And then it clicks the last step is clicking that. Cool. So just so everybody's clear that, that that's the code and that's what's happening. And that this is where it would be in Zoom, but it would be happening so fast that you wouldn't see anything uh, happening, correct? That's right. Great. That's exactly right. Cool. So I just wanted to make sure we were clear. If there's any questions, now would be a great time to throw them into the chat on Facebook or here. We have some that are populating into our um, Zoom. So I'm going to stop my share. Yeah. And we've got uh, we've got some interesting questions. Cool. So let's so, uh, let's take a look at some of those. Um, starting with uh, Frank Henny's question. Is this bi-directional? Can you act on Zoom events and make the Apple system react? If a participant enters or leaves Zoom, can you trigger a sound in OS X, for example? No, you can't. It's, it's not bi-directional at all. That I have to have the script test if something is there in Zoom. Zoom doesn't give us any way, with Apple script anyway, to get triggers. And that problem is why Andy Carluccio started building Zoom OSC, as I understand it. And if that's the problem you want to solve, there is no question that Zoom OSC is the answer. And let me say, since, since I brought that up, the, the primary reason for me that I don't use Zoom OSC, well, the primary reason is that this works. And it works every day and it does everything that I need it to do 95% of the time. And so I just keep doing it because I haven't had time to really learn Zoom OSC really well. Um, and, um, and it's one of the things that's on the list that I'm hoping in the next couple of months I'm going to get a chance to do. And, um, but the bigger thing is they did put the ability to start a screen share into Zoom OSC, but the last I knew, it was only desktop one. And there was no way to select a different desktop. And I think there also is no way yet to control whether you're sharing audio or whether you're in the optimized for video mode. And I need all of those. Um, so if I was going to 
not use the Zoom screen share function. And I was going to go in through my web presenter as a camera instead. I probably would use Zoom OSC. Um, but because this works really well, and because often the screen shares uh, are much better resolution than doing it as a camera, um, and because 99% of what I'm screen sharing is still. Like occasionally somebody wants me to run a video, but it doesn't happen very often. So um, mostly it's just PowerPoint stuff. And so I want every pixel of resolution I can get. And I don't really care about motion because I tell people that they're not allowed to use any animation or effect or transitions because they don't work well over Zoom. Well, and that's interesting that you say that because then uh, actually to get higher resolution out of the screen share, n clicking not having the optimized for video enabled right. for, for a still image would give you a better yield you a better result. And that's what I do. Got it. Oh, oh, yours is to uncheck it if it's checked. It's to uncheck it Copy. if it's Got checked. It. Sorry. Unless I use the other script, which is identical in every way, except that it makes sure that the optimized for video box is checked. So then when, um, when I'm going to do a video that way, I, um, I do do that you know, so I can show a video. And like I said, I can build the show in QLab that, all right, we're going to come out of the screen share for the opening of the show, do the opening. Then we go in and we do these six PowerPoint slides. And then we go back to the host who then throws to a video. And when the screen share for the video starts, it'll be the optimized for video because I'm using, I'm, I'm triggering the other script. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then I assume, and maybe maybe Ori has some input on this, that you could bake into that script, for example, if you had to do multiple screen shares that um, throughout an event that maybe needed to be different slides, you could advance the... Uh, I'll show you, in a, once we get through looking at the actual scripts, I'll pull up the QLab file for a show because it's not, the script doesn't change. That's the thing that's so cool about this is that I got it right once and now it's done. Right. Unless they screw it up by changing Zoom. And, um, and then I do everything else in QLab programming where I'm comfortable. So, and I'll, I'll show you how I do that in a sec. Um, but let's look at the rest of the questions. Um, sure. We have a couple from Facebook. Sure. Uh, Roman Turney earlier had asked, uh, this looks great, and then I'm guessing you chuck this onto a stream deck for e for ease of use, which you yep. showed us a virtual stream deck, but you actually put this on physical buttons? Yep. Yep. The virtual stream deck I showed you is a is the virtual version of my physical stream deck. Got it. Thank you uh, for that clarifying. Um, uh, Roman had also asked uh, about getting a closer look and maybe getting the file, which you did answer that you you don't like sharing these things, but you're yeah. happy to, uh, you're happy to teach other people and show them how this works. Correct. Absolutely. So and, how, and, how would somebody get a hold of you? Um, I, I'm going to, I'll, I'll give out my, my email address, I guess, Andrew dot Dolph, D O L P H at UNH dot E D U. Um, and tell me that you were on this, or that you saw the video of this, so I know <laughs> what you're talking about. Um, and I'll get back to you when I can, but you guys know how production goes. So there are times when I will respond very quickly. There are other times it might take me a week. If a week has gone by and you haven't heard from me, then I probably lost it and write to me again, and that's fine. Well, Andy, maybe what we can do also is um, maybe we can get you on our Discord. Uh, AV Tech Talks has its own Discord sure. server. Uh, I just put the link to that on Facebook and I'll put it here uh, in case anybody isn't already part of the community, they can join uh, and then they'll be able to find you there as well. Yeah. Discord is great. Or if people are on the office hours discord, I'm there. Right. Um, 
And I will absolutely join that. I am copying the link to move to the other computer. Because, by the way, one of the things that helps make this reliable is that I put as little as humanly possible on this machine. This is my Zoom computer. Got it. It does Zoom. Um, I do have a couple of things, other things that I will use on it. Um, it's pretty much all Apple software. I will open Apple Mail on it. Sometimes I will run PowerPoint on it if I need to. Um, I'll run Apple Calendar if I need to, because often I'm using that with Zoom. Um, but even that really isn't, even Mail and Calendar aren't a great idea, but I've tested it enough that it hasn't been a problem and I'm okay with it. Um, but on the QLab website, there's a... Um, document the title i think is a computer prepares that tells you what they think you should do to set up a computer and the amount of stuff that they want you to turn off is substantial and it makes a huge difference and it's one of those things that you can try running your show on a standard setup and it may be fine until the day that it isn't because there are things like the Spotlight Search Indexer that maybe weren't running when you were um, doing your test, because you would never know. And all of a sudden, during the most complicated part of your program, your time machine backup kicks off and your Spotlight Search kicks off, Search Index kicks off at the same time. And all of a sudden, the thing you had plenty of headroom for the machine to do, it doesn't anymore. So I am a big fan of treating show machines as appliances as much as possible. Um, that, that makes sense. And I was going to ask, I was going to ask part of, uh, you know, how you prep your machine. Um, I do want to get to a couple more questions yeah, first, though. And I did put the, uh, the link to... Um, Sorry, it's the link to QLab in the chats for you guys, uh, and you can find that document uh, that Andy was just referencing. There is actually also, uh, if you can navigate to the uh, to the page for a computer prepares, there's also a workspace that you can download that will take care of all of those settings for you. I have had mixed results with that workspace. Like hmm. I've had that script error on me for reasons I couldn't figure out. And it really isn't that hard to cut, cut and paste the commands to the terminal. And for me, I, I either, it's either a QLab machine or it's not. Mm -hmm. So like on my daily driver laptop over there, I have um, two OS installs on separate partitions. One that's the one I use every day and one that's called shows. And the shows partition is set up for when I need to use it as a show machine. Um, and that's how I do it. Um, I do know that, uh, that the gentleman I was mentioning, the variety entertainer, um, he can only travel with one computer for weight limitation reasons. Um, and so he has a script at the beginning of his QLab file that rearranges his computer to put it into QLab safe mode. And then another one at the end of the show that he runs to take it out of QLab safe mode. And I know there are people who do that. It would scare the shit out of me to do that. Yeah, I same just, here. You know, that my answer is more computers. They're just not that expensive anymore. <laughs> and I would rather, as much as I possibly can, treat it like an appliance. You know, I'm designing a portable system for streaming events for the university when things start back, some in-person things that people are going to want people to be able to see remotely. And there's going to be six Mac minis in that rack so that basically every task or primary use has its own computer. Unity Intercom will have its own computer. QLab will have its own computer. Um, there'll be one computer that's just dedicated to control software for other things like the ATEMs. Um, and it just, when, you know, we're talking less than $1,000 for a Mac Mini, 
um, it just isn't that much money in the scope of a system that costs tens of thousands of dollars. Right. Um, and it also gives me built-in redundancy because it means that if one of those machines goes down, I can probably move some of those functions onto another machine that's also doing something else. And, um, and it means it's nice and slick when everything's working. And if something really, really screws up, uh, I'm not completely screwed. Um, cause I, you know, I don't have the budget to do Alex Lindsay level redundancy as much as I wish I could. Um, but I think very few of us have the budget to do Alex Lindsay anything. Um, well, isn't one Alex only $700? Yeah. But. Well, it was. You can't even buy Photoshop anymore. You can only rent it. Yeah, yeah. Um sorry, I just want to grab a couple of these sure, please. questions real quick. Uh Sabrina McCalla asked, uh, does it potentially does a potential crash or sorry, it potentially crashing make you paranoid when working with high end clients? And you kind of talked about that, but yeah. So let me let me be clear about where I said it might crash was the, was that UI browser app that I use for figuring out how to write the Apple script. So far, the Apple script that I have written using that tool um, has been stable and has not caused me any problems over hundreds of shows. Okay. Um, if I, um, it, that, and, and I would never have UI browser open when I was doing anything important. I mean, I would have never had it open while I was doing this class if I wasn't going to show it to you. Right. Um, that I only have it open when I'm doing development, um, which is not never on a show, of course. Um, the other thing is that there's a reason I have a computer behind me even though it doesn't get used on every show. And that is that, yeah, I do some shows where I need both computers. And if one of them crashed and I didn't have another one here, it would be a problem. Now, I also have two more Mac laptops that I haven't even talked about that live here that I use for other things occasionally that are kind of not related to what we're doing. But one of them is a QLab machine. So I could flip over, you know, I have a fair amount of redundancy and the more important the show, the more I actually move the files, copy the files onto backup machines so that if something crashed, I would be a few seconds away from having it back up. Um, honestly, the biggest issue that I have had with any regularity has been power blips. And um, and so now I have the, um, I have my, I have this, this main computer and my router on a UPS, which has solved that problem. And then I've also just gotten a second UPS, which I haven't put in yet. Um, that's going to go on the cable modem, which is the other room, which is in the other room because that's where the cable is. Um, so it was either buy another UPS for the cable modem or run an extension cord out the door of this room into the next room and over, which seems silly when I could buy a very, very small UPS, which will run a cable modem for a very, very long time. <laughs> right. Yeah, of course, of course. Because I'm not trying to survive an outage. I accept that if we have an actual power outage, the show is going down. But knock on wood, the power here has been reliable at least as reliable as the power on campus. Um, you know, it goes out occasionally, but usually not more than once or twice a year. Um, and not for, usually not for more than an hour or two. Um, so um, if there's something really high profile or a day where there's a lot, a lot of moving parts, I'll have a backup tech at another location scheduled. And um, we'll, you know, transfer the show to somebody else. Gotcha. I mean, we had one day where we had eight webinars in six hours that were scheduled to be teched by two of us or three of us. 
And um, one of the techs called me about 20 minutes before the first show he was doing was supposed to start to say that his dad got just got taken to the hospital in an ambulance having a heart attack and he was going to have to bail. And of course he was. And because we had a backup plan, I made one phone call and said, hey, um, you know, here's what's happening. I need you to, to take over, um, you know, and here's the line in the spreadsheet with the information for which webinar you're supposed to do. And basically I jumped on the one that the guy whose dad had a heart attack had to take over because that was the most complicated one that was happening that day. And I had been in the rehearsal and then my boss, who was the backup person took over a, a very simple show that I was going to run. And then once we got those up and running, I figured out how to redistribute the rest of the day in a way that made sense based on who we now had. And nobody ever knew there was a problem. Um, and that's the goal. Now, do we always have that, you know, that where I'm doing, well, we teched, we had a tech running 144 webinars between April and mid-November. I haven't counted since then. Um, can I have a backup tech scheduled for everyone? No, it just, it's just not on the budget we have. Um, but the good news is that most of the stuff that I'm doing from here on most shows are nice to haves, right? So we're doing, let's say we're doing a town hall. We've done a lot of town halls with the administration and uh, we're doing a town hall and my power goes out. I log in on my phone and I can still drive the webinar from my phone. We're just not gonna have graphics. But if I tell them my power just went out, I'm back, I can still drive, but we're not gonna have graphics, they would say, okay, no big deal. And, and part of this is knowing your clients, right? So I'm in-house at the University of New Hampshire, which, is a place that's a lot less formal than a lot of other places. Um, that informality and and in a kind of Yankee, you know, sometimes um, sometimes gaff tape and chewing gum is an acceptable solution. <laughs> is, is kind of a, a typical attitude. So like we want to make it look as good as we can, but our resources are constrained and everybody knows that. And so we do the best we can with what we have, you know, that um, the Yankee spirit is alive and well at UNH because it's the only way we could survive on as little money as we have. Right. Which is what I think, you know, uh, John, who's here with us, uh, you know, he's in it. Uh, involved in education. We hear that all the time. I think that's a familiar story that anybody, uh, we usually have Justin Herminghouse who uh, is also in education. And that's a the similar kind of story we're hearing across the board, it seems, is that the uh, make do with what you have, do more with less. And uh, we don't know if there's going to be any more money coming. <laughs> but, but budgets are tight. But also it's been interesting here in the California State University system that as COVID relief funds have come out and the system is online, this has been one of the areas where some of our funds have been spent to both upgrade facilities, uh, make it easier for some of our faculty and, and particularly equity issues of access for some of our students. So hotspots and other things like that. But uh, Andy, yeah. I feel your pain. Uh, the, the, to me, sometimes it's easier to find budget than it is to take equipment from some other facility. So I hats off to you yep. that you were able to <laughs> get that gear out of one department to another. Uh, I one. was I was very fortunate that um that they were just completely shut down. And all they have to do when we're done is completely re-image is just re-image the computers. Because they're they were part of a, a management system that controlled them. They they unmanaged them for me so that I could set them up the way I needed, and then they'll just remanage them when they go back. Um, in the meantime, you know, it's it it's been a savior for us. Um, so Andy, we're getting uh we're yeah. 
We got about 25 minutes until we close out again. Okay. Um, uh, Eugene Palmer had asked, uh, can you use this to change Zoom backgrounds as an alternative to Zoom OSC? Maybe. I haven't tried. Um, you'd have to go into UI browser and see um, if you can navigate what you need to navigate with stuff that you can figure out that appears reliably the same way each time. Um, I, yeah, I'm, that would be a big, that, that strikes me as hard. Um, but um, I don't use them and I try to convince people not to use them because mostly people aren't set up well enough to get a good key. And I think people's hair appearing and disappearing is so distracting that I um, would prefer that people have whatever their background is, however ugly or dirty or whatever. I would rather that than to see half their hair appear and disappear during their speech. So it's just not an issue that I've dealt with. Um, that And likely, if I had that problem, likely where I would go is Zoom OSC. Got it. Uh, Richard Bakos asked us, is there a scripting program for Windows? Yes, there's no question there is. Um, in Windows, uh, there's something called PowerShell. And I don't know if you can do this kind of UI scripting in PowerShell or not, because I know that it exists and that's about the limit of it. Um, it there's... Um, there, there's five Macintosh computers in this room right now, um, and an i and two iPads and an iPhone. Um, and um, next door, there's another Mac, and across the hall, there's another Mac. I've pretty much um, I will use Windows when I need to, but I am not anywhere near as at home on Windows as I am on the Mac because. I spend so much time on the Mac that I've learned um, a lot of these kind of optimization and control and so forth. And um, I'm not a person who sees it as a religious argument. I mean, I, I think, you know, do you want a Ford or do you want a Chevy? You're going to have problems with either one. Pick the one you like better. Um, for me, the thing that's locked me onto the Mac is QLab because I've been using QLab for almost as long as QLab has existed, since before it had any video functions in it at all. I remember when he announced, when it was, it was just Chris, Ash, Chris Ashworth developing it, and he announced that they were going to add video support. Um, and, uh, and that was back in QLab 1. And so I've just developed a lot of skill and experience making QLab do what I want. And to have to go to something that runs on Windows, um, probably ProPresenter or something like that, um, I think I would be frustrated by it because I'm just so used to how to make QLab do what I want it to do. And, and it's so flexible. For any, anybody who's watching who isn't super familiar with QLab, it is a Mac-only based program. Uh, we did an episode uh, that Ori led over the summer uh, on QLab to get you started. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put a, a link in the chats where you can go see that if, uh, if you don't, aren't already familiar with QLab. Uh, but it's very popular in theater, very powerful program. Um, you mentioned, uh, Andy, we just did uh, a, a, an episode last week on ProPresenter, which uh, has similar features but a very different kind of uh interface and different things uh, it's laid out differently um but qlab is very popular in the theater um and that's what uh, the integration of qlab with apple scripts is what's allowing you to do this and i think that's important to mention that it it can um interpret these uh scripts that you write and then create actions on them and send out commands to do these sorts of things Right. There's actually a, a type of queue in QLab called a script queue right. that you create a script queue and you put your Apple script in it. And um, that is what allows all of this to happen. Um, 
And yeah. I've looked at ProPresenter and I think it's a great tool. And for some of what I do, it would probably be easier, but I'm only going to have one tool mostly for money reasons, but also for experience, you know, just having a really deep knowledge of one tool rather than less deep knowledge of more. Um, and QLab does pretty much everything I want. Right. So it looks like there was an attendee with their hand up. Uh, yeah, we do have a question. Oh, well, that went down. So uh, we do have a question, though, from uh, from a Zoom attendee, uh, Mickey. Uh, I, I never know how to say Mickey's last name, but Mickey from Office Hours. Uh, Apple script to trigger commands on ATEM software control versus OSC to trigger ATEM OSC. Pros or cons? Honestly, I have never, it has never occurred to me to try to, um, to try to Apple script automate ATEM software control um, because it's such a hack and it's so easy to break um, with software updates. So I see it as a tool of last resort. I did this cause I couldn't come up with a better way. So, um, I think ATEM OSC is a great solution and I would, um, I would absolutely start there. And if there's a way to do what you need to do that way, I would absolutely do that. And I, I'm pretty sure that the QLab developers would probably agree with me on that, that, um, that, and, and it's one of the reasons that I try not to use AppleScript. I see AppleScript as risky. Now, it's not super risky. I mean, obviously, I'm using it. But the more complicated it is, the more risky it is, in my opinion. And, um, and so uh, this is really the first time I've ever used AppleScript during shows. I've used it to help write cues like automate repetitive cue writing and settings changes and some of that kind of stuff, but never something that I would do that actually had to run the script during a show. So, or did you want to say something? Um, yeah, just piggybacking on what you, you were saying. I, I, and, and following in line with what you were talking about one machine for one job, um, you're outputting your content on QLab Yes, the scripts are not that memory intensive, but they, uh, as Andy said, they can break things. Uh, in the early development stages, when I was tinkering with some scripts, I, uh, I locked my control key on by accident and had to figure out how to reboot the, script, uh, the uh, computer with a mouse that wasn't functioning normally. <laughs> I did the same thing, not with Apple Script. I did it because my keyboard got stuck under something, pressing down the control key. And it took me like 20 minutes to figure out that that's why the right click was stuck on. Yep. Similar experience, I, but script breaking it. <laughs> um, I just want to show uh, one more script before we get too far. And that is the one that ends the screen share. Um, so. What I've done here is same basic process, make sure Zoom's running. And um, so that's here. And then we do the same test. Are we, that is essentially asking the question, are we in a screen share? And if we are, then ending the screen share is valid. And all we have to do to, to end it is command shift S. So, Command shift S and we're done. Or in this case, if it doesn't exist, if this screen share status bar window doesn't exist, we come to the else, we hit the return, we're out of the script. Um, so let me jump over to a different file. Um, and let's see, 
open workspace. What do I have that would have something interesting? Uh, well, Andy's looking for that. Does anybody on the uh, on the panel have any questions or comments? No. Well, as uh, as the DVE store mentioned in in the Facebook, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and uh, that's absolutely true. If uh, you know, if you can't figure out how to do an operation. Uh, you know, this is at least a uh, a method that Andy has found, and it may work for for some other people until you can find some other means to do it. Uh, Andy, it looks like you got your yep. So, um, so this is a somewhat more complex show. That in this case, it was a it was an extended like a, a multiple hour conference. And they may and they uh, they sent me a PowerPoint actually of a slideshow that they wanted to run of a different slideshow to run during each break. Now, what I've done for years, rather than bring those into QLab as individual queues, which I found if you do too many of them at least at one time, and this is probably QLab two, uh, could make it unstable when you tried to loop it infinitely. Um, what I do is bring is I export them as stills, bring them into Final Cut Pro. It takes me two minutes to make a video. I, I, if I'm doing it in Zoom, I don't put transitions between them. If it's for an in-person event, I put dissolves between them, but not at the beginning or the end. So the file begins and ends on a hard cut of the same slide. So that then when I tell QLab to loop it infinitely, it loops seamlessly. And if I want to fade into it, I fade into it in QLab. So, um, so here, what I've got is, you know, the pre-show starts this movie and the background music, and then it stops. And then again, I start this movie, which is the next slideshow for the first break and it stops and then the next one. And just as we hit each break, um, I did that. And then the last one, this was a still not a movie because it was just one thing we needed to leave up on the screen. Um, and for instance, if I wanted, I don't think I have an example handy with a countdown timer, but I would just make the countdown timer in motion as a video and play out the video in QLab over the top of whatever else it needed to. Um, and this is where having a lot of facility in QLab is really useful because I can have a plain countdown timer file that's just a countdown timer on an alpha channel um, or that's a countdown timer in a box or whatever I want, and I just put it wherever I need it in QLab. Um, other people would do it differently, and I'm certainly not saying that I think any of this is like the right way or maybe even a good way to do this. Um, it's just a way that works for me. So. Um, no, that's great. That's uh, and and showing that organization in QLab is uh, is helpful that, you know, you can group things and. Mm hmm. You know, but it is so personalized. So many people work in so many different ways. Uh, and there's, you know, the, the great thing about QLab is there's so many resources and so many people in the user groups who are um, willing to share yeah. how they do things and, and some of the cool uh, programming that they've uh, they've come up with <clears throat> to solve issues um, that people are trying to figure out. So. Yeah, absolutely. And um, this is another, um, this is another, this is like something that came in as a PowerPoint that I exported the slides. Um, so in this show, we started at the top of the show with a pre-show slide, background music that goes away. And then once the, the host is going to go into her PowerPoint, then I bring up the first slide, start the screen share. And now I stay in the screen share through all of this because these are all slides that are supposed to happen. And I'm just hitting go on my stream deck every time I need another slide. Um, and um, 
It is important, by the way, to end cues, particularly video cues in QLab, because otherwise they will take memory the whole time. So uh, there's a great new function um, that's re relatively new that's in the triggers tab for the queue. You can say when starting the action of this queue, you can check off fade and stop peers. And peers means if you're in a group, anything else in that group. So basically, when I run any one of these queues, it stops over a tenth of a second because I want it to basically be a cut. It stops anything else in this uh, that's running. Now, it's very important not to set that on the start screen share queue, which auto continues from the first slide. Because if it did, I would put the first slide up, I would hit start screen share, and it would start the screen share and stop sharing the first slide because they're in the same group. Right, um, and, be and because your screen share is a command that happens in uh, in Zoom, you're not worried about the slide three stopping that command because it only has to run one time. Right, right. Once the script runs, it's done. And the fact that there is no feedback back and forth is actually useful in this That's situation. Correct. Yeah. That's correct. And here's the other thing. This queue only runs for a moment. Even if the script took a long time to run, it doesn't. But even if it was a script that took a long time to run, because this isn't the script, this is a start queue that just says, hey, queue over here in this other queue list, you go now. And once it's going, this isn't a peer for anything in this queue list. Right. So, um, so that's not that's not a big deal. Yeah, John. Uh, have you had any of your faculty interested in using this for their classes? It's a sort of a heavy lift, but it, yeah, no. Um, it that it's honestly. I mean, a lot of faculty have seen what it does because they've been involved with events that I do with it. Nobody's even asked. And we're not going to show it to them if they don't ask. Um, there are some folks in the theater department who use QLab in production. Um, but those, they're the only people on campus other than me that uses it. Um, and it just, it's one of those things that if I knew that there was a faculty member who was enough of a geek that I thought they would want to do it and was doing something where I thought it would be useful, I'd be happy to show it to them. But it just is, in most cases, a bad idea. And while all of our events are fully remote, as of this fall, Mo, uh, f over 50% of our classes are back in person, but they're largely in person in a hybrid mode where, you know, a third of the students are in the room on Monday, a third of the students are in the room on Wednesday, and a third of the students are in the room on Friday, and the rest of them are on Zoom. And so, honestly, the way they mostly want to use Zoom in those situations is pretty simple um, because they're just bringing the rest of the class virtually into the room. And all of the heavy lifting of that is done by the installed AV system in the room we have. We've put in um, one beyond auto tracking cameras and, um, you know, and Crestron control. And we were, I mean, all of our, all of the classrooms that AV is responsible for were Crestron controlled before the pandemic. Um, but as you said, we've put a bunch of CARES Act money into um, equipping rooms to be Zoom capable. And I'll mention, by the way, that we have worked really hard to get people to not call them Zoom rooms, but to call them Zoom capable rooms. Because if anybody doesn't know, a Zoom room is a product, a software product you can license from Zoom. And we have like four of them. And so we wanted to really train people that, no, these are Zoom capable rooms. They're not Zoom rooms. 
And I also try to get people to not use the term Zoom room for a Zoom meeting, although I have much less success with that. Yeah, John. Okay, my disclaimer, because people may know that I have a relative who works for Zoom, but uh, are any of those Zoom rooms actually Zoom rooms? Because that would give you the three screens and they give you some other features that you could use in class. We've got them in a few places. And our experience with them, at least early on, was that they were more trouble than they were worth. Because we had a lot of trouble with the control tablet not reliably connecting to the to the computer and um and that what we've done is and most of our rooms are one projector anyway so um and what we found is that most faculty want to touch their laptop and as little else as possible and so what we've got are setups that they walk into the room, put their laptop down on the podium, plug in a USB cable, and they get audio that shows up as a microphone and speakers and video that shows up as a webcam through a web presenter or, or similar device. And... Um, then they just use Zoom on their own computers because that's how they wanted to do it. Um, I'm a huge fan of Zoom rooms. And in fact, that, um, that system, that streaming system I'm talking about building, the Zoom machines are probably gonna be Zoom rooms. Um, so, Great. That, I, so I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it, but my colleagues found it to be a support problem, basically. That's more of the hardware issue then, because you can get reliable uh, controllers. Sure. And uh, for for me, we're playing with the, the portal as a Zoom room, because that's the cheapest uh, auto follow camera you can get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those One Beyond cameras are not cheap. They're, they work pretty well, but they're not cheap. Yeah, John, we might have to have you come and talk about uh, port. Maybe you and Guy can just do a whole session on portals. I'll have you guys come in and tell us, give us the whole rundown on the Facebook portal. That might be a... Well, Guy, Guy and I were early adopters of that. And of course, there'll be a uh, Amazon one out. You could use it on the Echo 8-inch, but there's the 10-inch, which is not being ship yet has an auto tracking with a motor different than the way that the uh, Facebook portal does it. Oh, cause yeah, if, uh, portals more of a EPTZ as opposed to anything that's actually actuating, right? Yeah, where the uh, Amazon actually, you know, mm -hmm. has a motor going back and forth. But nice. Andy, for, for us, a lot of the, the faculty are, we're all remote now, but they're talking about having teaching assistants so that they don't have to deal with the Zoom. And we're, we're trying to figure out in these hybrid modes how to make both the remote people and the in-class people feel connected, which is something that uh, those of us who are on office hours, uh, Alex believes is not ever possible to do. But yeah, and my experience has not disagreed with him. Um, I, I really agree with Alex on that issue, and I, I am in the process of designing a system which will largely be used for doing hybrid events, because I have no question that no matter what we want to do or think people should do, that they're going to demand hybrid events, and I think it's a terrible idea. But... So pretty you know, soon, John, you're going to have to have in the job descriptions... Um, for teaching assistants, they have to know Apple scripting and QLab to be able to help in the automating of Zoom. Well, between QLab, OSC, and Apple script, I have to admit that Andy, this was impressive. I, I was a, I've been a Mac guy for a while. I've had to use everything, but when I, I finally got tired of rebuilding Windows machines on a regular basis, uh, and so I would use Apple script. And the same way you did, I go into Google and find something that did it. I never really learned it, 
But I have to admit, I was very impressed with what you did, particularly with well, thank you. the accessibility. That's uh, the mother of invention there. You're, you're a brave man, but you got it working. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, if you do uh, set up UI browser, you have to go in to system preferences and give it permission to do things uh, because otherwise Apple security will uh, not like it very much. So with, with your faculty, have you talked about the, the issue of, you know, or I guess I'm sure you have, but the, the challenge we're having here is we know they're going to do hybrid. We know that it's a problem. We're trying to, with this faculty support group, talk to the faculty to think of the in-person class as sort of the live audience, but focus the hybrid classes to the people who are remote. And if you get that mindset, um, then, then there's an emphasis of both the students in the classroom and the faculty member to make sure they're paying to the attention who are, who are the remote students. And, yeah. and that's where the greatest risk is, is the remote students just feel that they're, they're, they're watching something, but nobody cares about them. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm not sure how much we've done with that because really I am, while I'm in the group that does academic technology support, um, I'm purely events and have been so busy. I've been busier since COVID started doing remote events than I've been in 20 years of doing in-person events. So I know that there is a lot of training that's been going on for faculty and discussions about how to do things well, and I have no idea what the content of it is because <laughs> I just have not been involved at all. And uh, gentlemen, this is a you know interesting topic, and education is su super important. And I would urge anybody um, who is an educator uh, check out office hours on Saturdays because they talk about education uh, for the whole uh, afternoon, pretty much uh, in their second hour. Well, depending, I guess, where you are. For me, it it it's still, I guess, morning. Sometimes we'll spills into afternoon. On. But uh, this Saturday particularly will be good because the uh, the person who runs Southwest South by Southwest EDU, which is an education event, right. the week prior to that is going to be speaking. So it should be it should be a good uh, session this Saturday. Right, and then doesn't uh, yeah is, does Zoom OSC training start this week too? Not this week. I think it's next week. I thought it was the 30th. Okay. Well, either way, well, you guys yeah. should check out office hours. Um, you know, we talk about them often on the show. Uh, you can search on YouTube for Alex Lindsay uh, office hours and, uh, and you'll find it. Um, but we are past the hour. So we do need to start wrapping up the show. Um, so I just want to quickly uh, talk to our panel. Uh, Ori, I know you had some experience with this. Did you, uh, what do you think about Andy's, uh, scripting and what it does with Zoom. Um, I really enjoyed getting a look at your script, your workflow. Um, some things not necessarily the way that I have them laid out in my own workspaces, but that's always the best part about getting to see somebody else's workspace in QLab. Um, Absolutely. Learn a, learn a different approach, a different way to think. Um, the uh, the guess and or the uh, the checking routines that you wrote into your scripts very helpful. I will definitely be incorporating those into some of mine uh, that were a little trickier to operate without that. Yeah, I like those those little checks. Those those made a lot of sense. Now, Iris, I know you're typically a Windows user, but uh, as someone who doesn't do this and isn't a QLab user, what did you think about uh, the workflow? Did this make sense? It made sense. Um, I think it obviously has some limitations in it as well, but I haven't used QLab in years. Um, <laughs> but um, actually, it was a decent flow and it did make sense once you got it going. Um, in the beginning, I'm looking at it going, I don't know what's going on here, but I kind of figured it out as we went. So this is good. <laughs> and it's it's the classic thing too, where you spend uh, what I think you said three or four hours to do something that takes a split of a second, as you mentioned, once it actually executes. But once it's done, it's done for every time. So that's does your, that's. Does your video stay synced, or does it go off like because you're remote triggering? 
the remote triggering isn't a sync issue. Right. Um, my experience is that sync issues with video and audio playback in Zoom is um, a matter of are you throwing enough compute resources at it that when I once I went to the Mac Pro, I've never had another sync issue. I had all kinds of sync issues doing it on the laptop. And I was just like, I, I, I think more CPU and more memory will solve this problem. And it did. It absolutely did. And so like I'm actually doing a couple of events um, the end of this week where I'm jumping into a board meeting of the university's foundation just to show a video because I have a rig that will do it reliably. And, um, you know, so I'm going to jump in, show a five minute piece, jump out, let them go on with their meeting. And, um, you know, we can't do that for everybody because obviously the demand would be so enormous, but, Basically, if you can throw enough compute power at it, it seems to do okay. That's great. Um, Brent, uh, do you, could you see using this uh, for any of the shows that you uh, you do, like uh, Apple scripting or any kind of automation uh, using QLab? Oh, I definitely see a use for it. Um, I, again, I'm a, mostly a PC guy, but looking at it in the way QLab works, it is... Yeah, there's a there's something to be looked at there for sure. Um, I'm gonna have to play a little bit. I know I have a couple of Macs sitting on the shelf that haven't done much in a while, so I might have to dust one off and add another computer to my desk tomorrow. And, and it's worth noting, by the way, that there is a pretty much fully functional demo of QLab that it just if you save something, you can't reopen the the Q won't work when you open it again. Okay. So you can play with it to test most, I think there are a couple of limitations, but but only a couple. But they also have uh, rental licenses by the day mm -hmm. that are just a few dollars. So even if you yeah, need- A lot license, of my technicians have done that where they're, if they need it for a show, they'll do the by day license. And then eventually, hey, you got a full license. Beautiful. Yeah, rent, the rent to own model is great. I uh, I wish more software companies would do that. Um, cause it makes sense and it works out. And as Andy was saying, there's a lot of things you can do Like there's an audition window in Q lab. So you can build your show without having to pay in most cases, without having to pay for the rental license or full license or anything. And then just on show day, you might need to, to pay to unlock some of the features to, to make it export to second display, for example. Um, if you need two track audio, I use QLab all the time for play ons on corporate events, because if you're only playing left, right stereo audio, it's, it, you don't need a license. So, um, and, and you still have the ability to like edit the, you know, if, if there's too much space at the head of the clip, you can, you know, on a VOG, you can cut that down a little bit. So, uh, yeah, cause we've been using sports sounds on PC to do that. And it's kind of archaic. And I think, Q lab on a few of the keynote machines I have sitting around would make it a little bit more slick for our control rooms. So. Right. Yeah. Even they have, um, uh, Ori, can you remind me what the, uh, the, uh, what's like the instant replay, uh, function on Q lab. I can't remember what they call it. Um, the cart, the cart, Q, oh, okay. yes. Q carts. Yeah. So Q carts kind of work like an instant replay or a sounding board mm -hmm. where you can, you can map things to, to buttons and, you know, then map it to a physical button and uh, have it work well, very easily. So, Or I really use my stream deck that way in that situation that rather than put it on a cart on the screen, I just put it on a button, a physical button on a stream deck. And then I've got, you know, if it's sound effects or that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I actually, I, we don't have time to show it and it's not on this machine anyway, but um, to sort of push QLab in a way that was totally ridiculous. We had the New Hampshire House of Representatives um, doing a um, socially distanced session because there's 400 of them and their chamber is theater style seating. And uh, so they met in our hockey rink and um, needed us to provide an electronic voting system. So we used the 
classroom audience response system we have called iClicker. Um, but they really wanted something that would more or less mimic what they were used to seeing in the chamber um, so that it would be easy for them to adapt to it. And so I took the output of iClicker captured it with um, NDI screen capture, NDI scan converter, and brought that into QLab as a camera queue with uh, NDI siphon, and then did all of the graphics, all of the, the text of what they were voting on with, tight, with uh, text cues in QLab. And then when we needed to show the voting display, it would take that, it would add that camera queue in the appropriate place on the screen. Um, and I just built the whole thing out in QLab. It was um, a little bit cumbersome, let's say, but it worked really well because it let me give them something that looked almost exactly like the way it works in the chamber, which is what they were hoping for. That's great. That's that's Very cool. Nice. Very cool. Um, so with that, we're a little bit past the hour. Uh, Omar, do you have any have any thoughts so we can uh, get ready to close out? Yeah, no, I gotta, I gotta say, Ori kind of beat me to the punch, and what he said was, was, uh, you know, in my notes. I hope everybody else is doing this, but I was writing notes the entire time. I don't know if you guys can see all that, but um, I, I also was, was in the same boat as Iris here. I, I'm not a big Qloops guy, I'm not a big uh, Apple Script guy, so I was a little bit more like focusing to make sure that I, I got this if I ever got in front of a Qlabs machine. Um, but again, taking a note from Andy. Uh, you know, one tool, one machine. I, I know the ones that I use very well, the E2s and the and the vMixes right now. Uh, that's what I've been using, you know, all of COVID. So I'll I'll stick to my machines. Um, but uh, back to Ori's point earlier, you know, the I love what I love the most about what we do here is to see the workflows. And I, I got to admit, Andy, your workflow is the most unique I've seen out of everything we've done so far. Um, but it works for you very well, and, and it's it's your bread and butter, obviously. Um, so thank you for showing it to us and, and to the community and to letting us see it and to being just brutally honest with us about, you know, th what it can do and can't do and how it's a hack and how it all works out. I mean, that that is su super key to what, what you're teaching us here, because this isn't just a run and gun thing. You know, this is like you have to know a little bit about these things and be proficient in them to use them. And this isn't the kind of this isn't the kind of thing you want to run or try to do if you're running multiple things on one machine, which I totally when you said your install and you had mul I was like, yes, I, I was in my mind like that's how I would do my I would do di different machine for different things uh, just just to save CPU, to save memory, to save RAM, all that stuff, because a lot of times what we do or not we do, but what some people do is they run a lot of the machines and different programs and it causes a lot of problems and they start running into things. And it's because in the background, you added that program, it changed something that may be affecting the other piece of software. Um, and it happens a lot, you know, especially, you know, like watch out guys. And I'm sure QLabs has its own uh, plethora of things that it changes in the background that I'm mm -hmm. not even aware of. But I see Ori and Adam, you guys are shaking your head. So, yeah. Um, I got nothing really else to add to that. This was a, a super good show. I got tons of notes and things I got to Google now to, to make sure if I got to ask questions in the future, I'm able to keep up with it uh, and not just be sitting here like a you know deer in headlights. But Andy, I, mean, I really appreciate you coming on with us. This was a super great talk. Uh, honestly, the workflow is really, really cool. I was... I'm just dumbfounded, honestly. I, I, nothing I could say about it. I was dumbfounded about the whole thing. But thank you, Facebook land. Thank you, uh, Zoom. Thank you, everybody, for being here, the panelists and attendees. Uh, see you guys next week. Adam, am I missing anything? Uh, nope. And just talking about next week, I'll drop links in the chats to uh, the Facebook event page for next week. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, an open forum discussion. We did this back in November, and it was great. Uh, so bring your topics next week, whatever you want to talk about we will we'll get into um if you're somebody who has something you like some cool tip or trick we would love to see it and and our our community would love to see it so get in touch with us uh sometime this week we'll figure out what we need to do to get you on the panel and and be able to show that uh we absolutely want to see whatever you found you figured out during this pandemic uh that everyone should know definitely let us know what uh about that um so that's going to be next monday uh open forum discussion come join us uh omar what do you got sorry and one more thing so if you guys are i've been following us for new day we educate on wednesdays we do a podcast edition which is more of the the other side of the business um this wednesday we have john huntington who's the writer of show networks it's the whole book on it specifically for the av industry if you guys are interested in talking to him or hearing about that there's an event already up for that uh in the event side that'll be happening this wednesday at eight o'clock 8 p.m eastern standard time 
and John is absolutely not to be missed. He is brilliant and has done an incredible amount of amazing stuff and is a great guy. So I would absolutely encourage checking. Yeah, I, I got to admit that one's going to be a little crazy because I feel like it's one of those episodes. Where I'm not going to I literally not going to have enough time to cover the magnitude of what we're going to talk about, because he, he sent us some articles to review about the history of IT and how things are absolutely and where they've been. That he's won awards for. And that with his book, I mean, we're literally not going to cover it all, but it's going to be a great topic. And I hope people come in with their questions and stuff because he's clearly from what he's written and from what I've read and from what I've seen, the guy is, you know, a genius on a, on a whole other level. He's also incredibly good at explaining things that people find difficult to understand in ways that are understandable, which is an incredibly useful and important thing in this world. 100 percent. I agree with that. Great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I always, uh, I whenever I can, I tune into the, uh, the AV Tech Talks podcast that Omar and Austin Jackson host. Um, uh, you guys may have noticed Bodhi wasn't here tonight. Uh, he had a, a family thing that came up, uh, but uh, check out his uh, his streaming. He's still doing the, the charity for the kids. Um, Omar, I don't know if you have a link handy um, that maybe you can throw up. Um, I do not. <laughs> okay. So sorry, we'll, uh, you know, but on Discord, we can always get you that link. So join us on the Discord. I put all of our links in the chats uh, to the, the AV Educate Facebook page, the AV Educate group on Facebook, as well as our Discord. Uh, you can also join us on the webinar next week. I put that registration link in there. Oh, Ori has gotten that for me. So let me throw that. Ori in for the save, liking it. <laughs> oh, and, and he, he beat me to getting it on Facebook, too. So nice. Great job. Thank you, Ori. That's uh, that's Bodhi's uh, uh, Twitch channel. So go check him out there. And then, as always, we want to thank the DVE store for their continued support. Um, so please check out DVEstore.com. Guy and his team, uh, they they give us uh you know, they've been supporters from the beginning. We get a little bit of a better resolution uh, thanks to their support. Um, so go check them out for any of your uh, video needs at dvestore.com. I put that link in the chat as well. So with that, thank you all again. Uh, we will see you guys next week. Um, and we got other cool stuff coming up. And uh, join us on Discord. Join the community. And uh, we hope to see you and bring those topics. If somebody wants to show, so I, I really want, I want someone to come in and wow me next week. I want somebody to say like, hey, you guys have been sleeping on this really cool thing that I figured out. That's, that's what I'm hoping happens next week. Somebody totally uh, just blow me away, blow our, our audience away, and uh, we'll all be happy. So thanks again. Check you guys out next week.